Earth's open spaces are ever-changing and evolving. Are they everlasting? Places that have been revered and valued, often for conflicting reasons? Nature's beauty and bounty, are they as compelling as they are competing? Conservation, how do we protect and use our natural resources responsibly to ensure man's survival within the ecosystems we collectively call home? Questions, to be sure. A community embraces these challenges in search of answers, in a refounding of their centuries-old traditions. Here, on the banks of the Shenandoah River, in the shadow of Virginia's Blue Ridge Mountains, it's a race against time. The place is called Cool Spring, once a seasonal home to native peoples, settled centuries later by Europeans. Territory surveyed by young George Washington. A Civil War battlefield where hundreds took their last breath. Sacred ground, to be sure. The community is a Cistercian monastery now owned and cared for by the monks of Holy Cross Abbey. This program was underwritten in part by the University of Michigan's Herb Institute, Business for Sustainability, leveraging the power of business for a more sustainable world through research, education, and engagement with businesses both in the United States and around the world. And Juliana McDowell, Andrea Hatler Bramson, Brendan Freeman, Magic Lantern Theater. Additional funding provided by It was, uh, to say the least, a very different world inside and outside. You enter a particular community. It, you don't kind of enter monasticism in general. And I, I think that the fit felt very good for me at the time in the sense of the simplicity of the place, the, clearly the closeness to nature. The monastery is a very special gift to all of us who live near there. A lot of folks come out there to the monastery to walk on the grounds. It's a safe place that uh, you're quite comfortable in. It's a place to recreate. It's a, a sense of place that, that um, it's like home. It's like that welcoming sense of home. In the early days when I would ride over that land, on my horse, I, it's just, it, it was just an amazing experience. It's ethereal. You just look out at it and you feel a oneness with it. This beautiful place and peaceful community face an uncertain future. Their way of life is in jeopardy as numbers dwindle, and the fate of the land rests with the whims of future owners. But it's their way of life that somehow contributes to the fragility of their future. In the fall, as the days grow shorter, the monks of Holy Cross Abbey still rise well before dawn. We start the day early. Most people get up around 3 a.m. We're praying by, together by, by 3.30. Even our life of prayer falls into what we call liturgical seasons, which fall into step with the natural seasons. And you come to live in a, in a place like this, and you become so much a, more aware of your setting, of the stars, of the animals, of everything that changes with, with the seasons. 
At 3.30 a.m., that's when your day begins, in absolute silence, there is never any communication, even by signs or whatever. So 3.30 to about 4.15 is in choir, chanting the Psalms, listening to reading of scripture and the church fathers and edifying light of the saints. This daily ritual goes back centuries. These monks belong to an order directed by the rule of St. Benedict. They have been living and praying together this way for nearly a thousand years. There was this monastery in France that uh, a number of the monks felt it was just a little too comfortable. They weren't really living the fervor of the rule. And they went off to a rather deserted place, a woodland, that was next to a stone marker called Cis Tertium in Latin, this side of the three mile mark. <laughs> and that's how Cistercian got its name. It was purely a geographical street sign. <laughs> Two things that the monks definitely sought was they wanted to disengage themselves from an dependence upon the established order or feudalism. And they also wanted to live a simpler and less complicated monastic life. Both principles kind of moved them into fairly uninhabited places. And it was specified that our monasteries would always be in the country usually in the valleys. And they would uh, cultivate the land, transform it into uh, a working, farming, monastic community. That special relationship with the land eventually led a group of Cistercian monks to found a monastery in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. The monks came here in, in 1950, largely as a result of a fire of their original monastery in Rhode Island. So they looked around and they found a bit of property down here, this property specifically. And at that time, in 1950, all of our monasteries were geared towards a um, agrarian economy. And this had potential as a farm, obviously. And uh, gradually the little place built up till by the early 60s, there, there were some 68 people in this community in fewer buildings than we have now. A lot of people had an idea after the Second World War that they wanted to be monks. The vows these Cistercians embrace, poverty, chastity, obedience, also include commitment to and stewardship of the Abbey's land. For Father Maurice, once secretary to Thomas Merton, the prolific Catholic author and social activist, stewardship is a welcome burden. So I was born in Lancaster, Ohio, near Columbus, in 1935. When I was 21, in 1957, I went to Gethsemane Abbey in Kentucky. When I was at Gethsemane, I worked in the garden and. We made cheese and fruitcake. So I really appreciate how we can grow our food and where it comes from, working the soil and preparing it each year and watch it go into the dormant state during the winter time and how it comes alive again in the spring. We must be grateful that we are placed as stewards of this beautiful earth. I was then 22 years old, had come back from the Navy, was working as an accountant for Gillette Safety Razor Company, announced to my parents I'm leaving, and on July 25th, 1949, I left and entered the monastery. So I came in when I was 19, and most of the other guys, 19, 20, 21, it wasn't at all unusual in those days. We had a large group of young men, and plenty of hard farm work to do, and this was an active cattle farm, and we learned to throw hay bales and shovel silage and all kinds of exciting things. I remember watching a monk inseminate a cow, and I thought, I said, what are you doing? 
but uh, I come from South Boston, which is suburban Boston. So seeing cows and chickens and sheep was all new to me. And all this was done in silence. We all conveyed everything by signs. A pail of water was brought if we needed a drink, but we did not converse with each other. We uh, baked bread then, monastery bread. And it was always a treat because we would get one of the first loaves to test it. Especially in the winter time, it was cold. And so you really appreciated the hot bread with real butter melted on top. Every fall, the monks make honey products and fruitcake, but they no longer farm the land. And in the intervening years, the Catholic Church has undergone a seismic shift. Then we went through the whole phenomenon of Vatican II and the changes in how we saw the church and the church's role in the modern world and so on. We had come out of a practice of Catholicism that, that could even be rather regimented and a lot of things taken for, for granted and all of a sudden things were being questioned and tested. Anybody in religious life is reevaluating what our future will be, how we can have a future, the fact that we have to do things differently, and that uh, we're living in a very different sort of church. As a 19-year-old novice, Father Robert eagerly bailed hay with his fellow monks. For 16 years, he served as abbot of Holy Cross Abbey, shouldering the responsibility of leading it through increasingly uncertain times. We're not the flavor of the month anymore. There was a time 50, 60 years ago when there was a fascination and a lot of young people wanted to do this. Now they want to do other things. We're uh, not getting replacements as we grow older and uh, monks die. That's normal, but then there are usually people coming along to uh, the continuity. We don't have that continuity. The youngest in our community is 57 years old. It's unfortunate we've had people come. They're always curious. They want to try it, but it doesn't hold them. We just don't know what the future is going to be. Today you have the internet and you have all, all kinds of stuff that distract a lot of people. It's interesting, a lot of the younger folks are not interested in making commitments to something like this. It's the older fellows that are coming to us now. People are not throwing their mortarboard in the air and running to his Trappist monastery. And Father Pascal believes his time is coming. Now I'm 88 years old. I've been in 67 years. I've stayed and uh, hopefully uh, the good Lord will look on me and love me and take me to himself. Ron Heath has been neighbor and friend of the monastery for decades. As an artist, educator, and builder, his skills have been valuable to the community. He sees signs of age and decay. It was becoming more obvious that we couldn't do things the same way over and over again and, and expect different results, that we had to be a little bit wiser about farming and, and um, well, even in the bakery. Uh, in, in, in the retreat house. The building itself, which was sort of my specialty, a builder for a number of years. The air leaking in through the windows and the doors and the, the lack of insulation, the way the water system had just been patched together over a number of decades of uh, making repairs. And there are other telltale signs that things are slipping. I remember one day seeing a pickup load of monks riding over from the, uh, the, the bakery back to the, uh, the dormitory and they chatting it up and having a ball just because they're riding in the back of a pickup and almost childlike, though they were all in there, in there having celebrated many, many birthdays. But, but a lot of enthusiasm, but that, that type of energy just couldn't continue, uh, especially with the aging community. Winky McKay-Smith served on the Clark County Planning Commission and she was the first chairperson on the Clark County Easement Authority. She becomes aware of the monks' fears of outside encroachment from developers working on adjacent properties. 
And the monks were very bothered about this. They, they knew it was going to make more noise, more intrusion on the, the things that they treasured about this place, which was its silence, its peacefulness, its spirituality. I wrote a letter to them broaching the subject of a conservation easement because I could see how involved they were and how responsible they felt and how they really wanted to keep it the way it was. It was 11 or 1,200 acres and three parcels. It was a big place. And it was very vulnerable to um, development. It's the most beautiful place to be. And if you wanted to build a ranch and mansion and enjoy the view, it would be the ideal spot. As fall comes to a close, the Advent introduces the upcoming colder winter season. Advent marks the beginning of the liturgical year and starts four Sundays before Christmas. For the next four weeks, the monks pray and repent, then rejoice and celebrate as they look forward to the birth of Christ. But this time, the joy is tinged with fresh apprehension about the monastery's future. Father Robert has gone in for a medical checkup. There was no pain, no, uh, no other uh, indication. It was invisible and hidden. So uh, went to the hospital for a shortness of breath, and that's when the CT scan showed the tumors in my right lung. I can remember very clearly telling me that uh, this was inoperable terminal lung cancer. I was in the hospital 48 hours, and with that diagnosis, everything changed. For the monks here, given our small numbers and the fact I've been the abbot for the over 16 years here, it was a big body blow. There's about modern medical science came up with a medicine that zeroes in on that precise type of cancer, which because it's non-smoker, it's more genetic. They have all these statistics showing that it successfully uh, attacks the cancer cells, uh, shrinks them to the point where they actually disappear. The cancer is not there. For now, the monastery must wait to see the outcome. In many places, Christians celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ in the coldest and least hospitable season of the year. Thomas Merton, who's probably the most famous Cistercian monk in modern times, once captured the great contradiction of Christmas this way. He wrote, into this world, this demented inn, in which there is absolutely no room for him at all. Christ has come uninvited, which is as much as to say, even in the most trying times and circumstances, miracles can occur. Staring into a future as bleak as the wintry landscape outside, the monks of Holy Cross Abbey turn back to their roots. The Cistercians have always had uh, take the traditional three vows that are part of most religious orders, poverty, chastity, and obedience, but they also take a fourth vow to stay in one place, to be care for the land where they are, to live in, the, in that community, and uh, for most of the history, farming that land as well. For many of the monks, what first drew them here was the power of the place itself, simple unadorned. It was the house, it was the monastery, not the order that was attractive. It was this 
building this group of people, this place. That's what grabbed me. One of the descriptions of a monk is, the Latin term is amato loci, lover of the place. When we came to a place that we lived there, we liked the place, and we transformed it to make it a beautiful place to live. In 2009, that deep concern for where they lived led the monks to commission a study that examined their community and their land. Everything that happens here in the water world is actually going to flow into the Shenandoah River. And that ultimately, the Shenandoah River is going to flow into the Chesapeake Bay. The students at the University of Michigan in the School of Natural Resources and Environment have to do a master's project. And so I got contacted one day by a, an alumnus uh, of the program whose brother had joined the Holy Cross Monastery. And she proposed the idea of a project on sustainability, which is my area. And uh, I was thrilled with the idea. It was just a great opportunity to, to connect this to spirituality, which I think is so important. And that's how we were, became involved in a sustainability study that looked at our land, our land use, our uh, habits around the house, our use of energy, our finances, our industries, uh, the water systems on our property and so on. The students, graduate students, had covered every square inch of the property and had documented and itemized everything. It, it was tough in the beginning because change doesn't come easy. And out at the monastery, it certainly doesn't come quick. Father James took the lead during the sustainability study. He was the liaison between the University of Michigan and the community throughout the year-long study, and since then, as activities have been implemented. I don't see sustainability and income as an either-or choice, but that we could be doing both. When it was proposed that we look at something like a sustainability study, it was very easily carried by the community because it was, it was something that was not unfamiliar to our spirit. It was a, quite an epic work, and uh, I was amazed at the detail that they went through. I mean, they went through everything from changing the light bulbs from incandescent lights to fluorescent. All the good things, and of course all the things that needed attention, which were many, and Better than that, they had wonderful solutions to keep the system, if you will, up and running for years to come. The plan that evolved from the study has become an unusual experiment, a demonstration of bringing together ecology and theology. When I found out that the Holy Cross Abbey had embraced a land management uh, plan, a formal plan, putting on paper and into practice what all of us had sensed that they were doing right all along was so cool. And it, it jarred the attention of the area. Uh, my family heard about it, uh, some of my friends and acquaintances in Winchester. I grew up in Winchester. I'm a 10th generation Virginian, and so to have this right here in our community is an example for us all. It's vital because these men are living an expression of stewardship that shows ecology and theology hand in hand. Ecology, understanding one's inner relationship with one's surroundings, the natural world, and theology, understanding our relationship with God, they go hand in hand. Being in stewardship with nature um, is, is about, it's about a belief system, it's about values, it's about culture. Um, it's about who we think we are, who we are, and how we relate to nature around us. So it's not strictly a, spirit, a scientific connection, there's a spiritual connection to it, um, how we relate to it, how we experience it. It's, to my mind, really about how we should coexist with God's creation and how we should act properly as stewards. And in a quiet community, that was, um, that was a tough sell. But uh, I believe the students endeared themselves to the, uh, the monks 
on a level that, that trust would take care of all the problems that would come up. What can one small group of men do? Nothing dramatic. We're not going to heal the ozone by saving paper and not polluting the soil with chemicals and things. But we can be a witness. We can, in our own way, show people that this is something very serious and it is something that is very rewarding to help heal the world. Healing begins at home with one of the monastery's key money makers, modernizing the bakery where the traditional fruitcake is made to sell at Christmas. So now we're moving into a different phase with our fruitcakes. They've become very famous, very popular, but we're looking at ways of improving them and being part of our sustainability effort. This is a uh, convection oven, and the rack just slides right in there, and the uh, heat comes from all directions, from the top and the sides, and the rack rotates around. The cakes bake in half the time, and they bake much more efficiently, much more evenly. A huge improvement. So e sometimes environmental efforts do pay off. Imagine that. Implementing the sustainability plan isn't cheap, and as they begin to do so, the monks receive a welcome financial boost. With help from the Clark County Easement Authority and the Civil War Trust, the majority of their 1,200 acres of land has been placed in conservation easement. There used to be an old song which was pave paradise and put up a parking lot, and that's what it's trying to avoid, is trying to keep the land open so it can heal itself, so it can produce so it can sustain a habitat for wildlife, so it can be a peaceful place to be. Lent is traditionally the season for fasting and doing without luxuries. But as this season begins, the monks of Holy Cross Abbey are happy to learn they won't be without their abbot as they move toward a more sustainable future. The new cancer medication Father Robert has been prescribed is working. Started it November 19th, and now it's been two months, and the evidence is the cancer cells, the cancer mass in my right lung, has decreased significantly. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Now he must lead his community down a path that encompasses more than just improving place. It requires them to improve themselves as well. Some of the Ecological projects we're doing now are, are like healing the riverbank, healing the, the stream banks, and we're also healing our life together. It'd be very inconsistent if we were good stewards of the land and bad stewards of one another. It's a, it's a total package. It, it, it's all about you know life living together, uh, seeing the interconnectedness of these lives, and even beyond the monastery to the larger community around us. How can the monks fulfill their age-old mandate of stewardship and attend to concerns raised in the study that will heal and sustain their land and community? They realize they'll need outside professionals to help them. The first time I drove onto the farm, I could see there were some problems. They had some soil health issues. The cattle were in the streams. And you can't have clean water with cattle in there. 
they cause a lot of problems. They defecate directly into the water. They trample the stream banks. Sediment is the largest pollutant by volume in any of our streams. When the sediment, pathogens, hormones get in the water, it's pollution, and somebody that downstream is going to have to pay for it. What's up, 811? How are you today? Hmm? The monks invited Bobby White's carver an area farmer and natural resources consultant who once worked for the Natural Resources Conservation Service to offer ideas and technical information about implementing sustainability activities. His recommendations were met with mixed feelings. I'm, I'm, I'm here to help you figure out what, what you want to do with your farm. I've been a conservationist for over 30 years. And uh, so, we started with a uh, conversation. The landowner, the monks, if you will, the abbey, they had a, this uh, sustainability vision. They just didn't know how to get there. And they had a farmer that, you know, at that time wasn't on board. And we all got in a room and we all worked together. And so I started to, to talk to them about what, what is sustainability. Now, they've got a much bigger picture than just the soil and the water but the soil and water is my bag. And uh, so we started on a path then of, of exploring options. And the, and the best option here on this farm was to have a different operation along the river, remove the cattle altogether from the Shenandoah River. What is sustainability? Well, that's a good question, Ronnie. Sustainability, in my opinion, is the same thing as conservation, and that is using your natural resources in a way that doesn't degrade them so that you can have the same beauty and the same bounty forever. We need to use our soil and our water and, and our trees and the air in a way that, that produces a, you know, a sustainable income for the monks and for the tenant farmer. And so it's got, you, you can't be sustainable unless you stay in business. You know, if, you're, you, know, if you, you go out of business, that's not sustainable. And the solution here was the country's biggest conservation program, which is the Conservation Reserve Program. That, that, that got it done. That was the program that got it done. It's voluntary and it pays rent on the footprint that we exclude, so you know you can't really say you're losing anything. You're you're getting rent for it. We're putting in a much better environment for everybody, including the farm, including the cattle. So everybody wins. And what we've done here is is not only fence the cattle out of the streams, but we've we've planted hardwood native trees, which which does a lot of things. First of all. The trees are going to shade the water to make it cooler, increasing the capacity for oxygen. It's going to provide leaves, which is the food for the macroinvertebrates. So we're providing aquatic ecosystem services, wildlife habitat, and we have to provide an alternative water source for the livestock. So. They drilled a well and we're pumping water with pressure to uh, various livestock watering stations throughout the farm. So we're getting more grazing distribution. I think in a very important way, whatever we're doing in terms of uh, projects of sustainability or, or ecology and conservation, it's realizing that well, when you live on 1,200 acres of land that happen to be on the Shenandoah River, you have a larger responsibility to your neighbors. In addition to increasing the width of stream buffers and planting native trees, another recommendation from the sustainability study was to diversify the monastery's land use. They entered into an agreement with Great Country Farms, a neighboring farming operation that is based on sustainable practices and techniques. Vegetables grown at Holy Cross Abbey 
are available to members of the farm's community-supported agriculture program. I think what the monks were interested in, in shifting away from agricultural practices that were damaging both to the land and to the watershed. And so one of the things that they were interested in when they started talking to us was, was whether, whether we could make this, this piece of land um, profitable using practices and systems that would actually improve the watershed rather than continue to damage it. So one of the things that appealed to the monks was the fact that we can raise a dozen different crops in, in this 150-acre strip using practices that, that will not wind up putting either more silt, uh, more runoff, or more agricultural chemicals into the river because the systems that we use keep most of the soil in place and they don't depend on chemical inputs. What's happening at Holy Cross Abbey isn't some pie-in-the-sky academic exercise. Indeed, it raises two profound questions. Can faith communities and agricultural interests find common ground? And is there a balance between working the land and consecrating it? There simply must be, says Professor Copenhaver. Religion is one of the ways we choose to relate to the environment. The monks are in this continual process of evaluating what is that appropriate relationship. So I see them as, as uh, both leading by example, but also learning as well. And what the monks here are doing is precisely what Pope Francis envisioned in his second encyclical, says ecologist and science educator, Dr. Bruce Rinker. Pope Francis, in his encyclical, is saying that science and religion, ecology and theology, necessarily go hand in hand as we deal with the environmental issues of our day, with their literal and practical interpretation of stewardship in a biblical sense. They are modeling for all of us how it can be done. And it's not that difficult. It's a mindset, it is, it's an attitude. These guys here are living it. The liturgical calendar and the solar lunar calendars are intimately connected. Um, look at Easter. The date of Easter is set on a lunar cycle. And that is a tradition that we've inherited from Judaism, which is based on lunar cycling. The sense of stewardship that the monks here have by following the rule of St. Benedict begins the night before. And that is an inheritance from Judaism as well. In the wee hours of the morning, that's when the day begins. And that is in the day-to-day -day practice of the monks here. They have it day to day through their prayer cycle, and they also have it seasonally manifest, whether it's the cold of the Christmas season or the joy of spring for the Easter season. There is that sense of ebb and flow of the natural world in and out of the monks' lives. When you come here and you drive through those gates, those front gates, as corny as it sounds, you are entering a completely different world. Not only the beauty of the place here in the Shenandoah Mountains, but the silence and solitude sets a different tone for your life while you're here. Many of the people who come here are not part of a parish or not part of a congregation or a church. Many of them are not even believers in God which is one of the great things about this monastery. There's no litmus test. This is a Roman Catholic abbey, and it follows the Roman Catholic principles. But this monastery is open to anyone who is looking for some silence and some solitude. Hospitality is a, a very important value from the beginning of monasticism, and it, it's, it is recognizing that we fit into a, a larger picture. In the retreat house, we give people the opportunity to come here for an unstructured retreat where our guests tell me many times it's one of the, the few places they can come to where they can get silence. 
where they're turning off their cell phones, where they can get away from the computer and so on and so forth, and that they have to deal with silence because there's, there's, there's nothing else here but that. Also that they get out of the, the stress and the bustle of urban life and come to a, a rural setting where they discover themselves in a very different way. They're not tied to their professional persona. They're not tied to the demands of a job. They're not tied down to a rigid schedule. They're free to come to the chapel when we're meeting for prayer or not to ever come there at all. It's just a, a very different experience and it's what we have to share. In a sense, it, it parallels our life. Uh, we give them that environment that they can partake in and uh, they get to share that with us. Occasionally there are retreatants in the community who get to share our schedule, our work, our prayer and in, in choir. Uh, that's another form of the hospitality. Uh, I think things like the fact that we have a large piece of property that many of our, our neighbors will come on to just to, to take a walk or to ride a bike or, or whatever. So it's also an important point of, of having a profile in the community and that we have something to, to contribute. So the boundary between the monastery and the non-monastic, the very large non-monastic world is much more permeable than it was, let's say, 60 years ago. This is the premise of simplicity, the idea that we will just take from the earth what we need. And this clearly is an understanding here at the monastery. Kurt Asherman is called a companion of Holy Cross Abbey. He has helped with fundraising, marketing, communications, and has recently conducted structured outreach programs and retreats. The thing that I realized over time that uh, I was able to use in my life were the principles of monastic life that centered around balance and, and how one balances one's life in terms of all the busyness that they have. If, if I were to describe one characteristic of a Trappist monastery, probably all monasteries, I would say balance is the characteristic. And there's balance in terms of what you own, in terms of your attachment to even ideas. I've identified 10 or 12 uh, contemplative concepts or monastic concepts that everybody can use that are applicable. Simplicity of life. One of the great things about being in a monastery is life is really very simple. These are principles that anybody can use, and detachment from possessions is one of them. We do something called monastic immersion weekends, and those are 48 hours of being immersed in monastic life. You stay in the retreat house, you have conferences with the monks, you attend all of the offices, including vigils at 3.30 in the morning. And the most unique part about it is while you're here for this weekend, you sit in choir with the monks, you chant with the monks. We don't know if that's happening any place else in the world. First of all, there is no pressure to be anything. This is a place of respite. This is a place where one can get away. It can be simply an escape for some people from the busyness of, of their jobs or the busyness of the city. Or it can be a place where they get into different kinds of religions. If they are of a different religion, they can get into it in nature. And also, I found that uh, the monks are so well-versed in a variety of religions, this can be a place where you can have discussions about wherever you are on your particular spiritual journey, on spiritual path. To a man, they say the monks' lives have been blessed, but time has not been kind. Not long ago, more than 60 men lived here. Now only 11 do. Their average age is on the rise. And with fewer men, more work has to be shared. Brother Efren, who tries to recruit new members for the Abbey, finds himself swimming upstream. I am the prior, a novice director, and vocation director. As vocation director, I do the recruiting. It's a life that God calls you, and, and you know when God is calling you to something like this. And I experienced it myself. And, and believe me, I bucked him, I pushed him away, and he just kept coming back right into my face. <laughs> Finally, when you realize that this is for you, there is a sense of peace that you wouldn't find anywhere else. You feel like, almost like you're in love. And it 
fits like a glove. A lot of people have to go down the road a bit and encounter, have a lot of life experiences in order to come to something like this. And sometimes I tell them, that's good. I'm glad you're doing that because when you come here, you'll really be solid. I had one guy who was here, he lasted exactly three weeks, and he says to me, um, I don't think I can get up at 3.30 in the morning for the rest of my life. I don't think, I don't like your food. And I think I want to fall in love again. And I said to him, in that order? <laughs> Recruiting, I think, it has to be carefully thought through. Um, it's not about getting our name out there because of what you're saying, that there is this deeper hunger. And when it's being authentically lived, that prayer life, the spiritual life, the monastic life, it uh, inevitably draws people. The other thing is that we have um, blocks of age groups that are just underrepresented. And so I've often thought that rather than trying to get some 20 somethings into the community, you work your way back, 60s, and then you get people in their 50s who can relate to the 40s, and 40s relate to the 30s, and otherwise you get these very young people, and it's very unfair to expect them to live in an environment with so much, where they've got no peers or very few. Because, I mean, obviously, there are people that God calls who don't respond. Now, I don't know how that works out with God, which you say, well, if you knew you were, you're not going to respond, why did I call you in the first place and waste the time calling? But uh, that's not quite, we don't understand God in eternity. With their ranks thinning, the Holy Cross monks realized they were at a crossroads. The monks could only wonder how their stewardship of the land could be maintained and how their ancient practices have to be modified in a modern age. Change they knew was necessary. What they didn't know was how to bring it about. There was a future instead of the looking at the past, the past history, the tradition. And now there was a, a future to look forward to what happens a few years down the road and the concern with the overall stretch of property, that several miles of riverfront and the, the farmland. The aspect that I, I seem to be most connected with, um, with my building skills and, and experience with the monastery was the, um, the natural cemetery that we, uh, we heard the, uh, the University of Michigan students raise in, in, in the publication that they did a wonderful design, a wonderful idea, a place to, uh, that uh, you, you can find not only peace, but you could find rest, eternal rest. When I say a natural burial, we do basically the same thing that people have done for thousands of years, of just putting a person in the ground without too much ado without all the, uh, the chemicals and without all the caskets and vaults and things involved. It helped engender that sense of place that you, you, you know this, this cemetery will always be green. It'll always be near the, uh, the river in the shadow of the Blue Ridge and um, just a magnificent spot that if you wanted to sit for a while, you could. If you wanted to lie there forever, you could. Photographer Kathy Kupka's daughter, Shaney, who died in 2014, was buried here near fields where she used to hike and camp. She lovingly took these photographs of what she calls Shaney's View, which a grieving mother visits nearly every week. My daughter was a hiker, and she used to hike around the Appalachian Trail. She would, I know she came here to hike around here, and she would have loved it. This place is beautiful, very comforting. I come here every Sunday, uh, 11 o'clock mass on Sundays, and then I come here afterwards. And I just talk to her, and I know she's up in heaven. When we started building the chapel, it, it was in a very obvious uh, 
a conspicuous spot. But the fact that it turned out to be right beside the road as soon as you come in the gate, it, it was a nice introduction to a place that had been aging, but that something new was going on. And that there was a, there, there was life there. It was quiet. It wasn't noisy. It wasn't big. It was, it was very gentle and it was very sensitive to the environment, but it was new. It's a natural sense that this is a chance of refounding ourselves. It's a different community. There's a continuity, but it's a different community than it was when I entered. And we are owning ourselves, owning our community. They're showing how to do it, and it's easy, and it's not expensive. It's a model that works not only for religious communities, but for secular communities. It works. And I think it's important to talk to people about their own water and their own soil and plants and forests on their farm. So each person has their own part. And, and you know, let's face it, every farm does contribute to either cleaner water or bad water. There is no piece of this property that is not completely as resaturated or suffused with God. And so the more uh, keenly you are aware of God's presence within you, the deeper your life of prayer, the deeper the appreciation for nature, the respect and honor that we give it, Nature is not there for us to dominate. Nature is there to, for us to act as proper stewards in balance with nature. So coming here, we found people that genuinely wanted to do that and find a better, better way to do that. And I think that is one of the critical issues of our day. And if a monastic community, if, if I was gonna look to anyone to try and put Pope Francis' words into action, I'd come to a place like this. If they can't do it, nobody can do it. This is my third term of six years. When it ends, I cease being abbot and we have an election. We present to you the abbot-elect of our monastery, of Our Lady of the Holy Cross. We ask you to bless him as abbot of our monastery. Has he been duly elected? We know and testify that he has. Thanks be to God. Abbot Joseph. In God's loving providence and by his mercy, you have been elected abbot of this Abbey of Our Lady of the Holy Cross. Jesus is Jesus is the Monk Sustainability Project is in its infancy, but the Abbey's new abbot makes it clear there's still work to be done. I think we, as a community, are at a point um, that is perhaps, and it seems paradoxical, that it's like the most hopeful in the last 10, 15 years. And part of it is because we have been, you know, we've arrived at this point where there's 11 members, professed members of the community. But there is a, a, a real sense of needing to make a choice um, and realizing that the outcome is as dependent on us as it is on God. And in the Shenandoah Valley, a small experiment has huge implications. Because the Monk Sustainability Project will not only affect this landscape, it could also define environmental stewardship for years to come here and elsewhere as this group of monks tries to replenish both the land and themselves. Saving place, saving grace. My greatest hope is that there will be a kind of, through this very crisis itself, a kind of spiritual awakening 
to values that have gotten lost. If I was a, a, a person wanting to experience sustainability, I'd be coming here because it's happening here. When you go to the woods or the field, you don't need a book. You just look at the wonders that surround you and see God in everything that's there. I personally believe if we're going to address things like climate change in our society, people need to start hearing it from the church, the mosque, the synagogue, the temple. The wisdom that's manifest here at Holy Cross Abbey, uh, they didn't